You are listening to the Let Me Overthink About It podcast, where I dive in to a series of topics that occupy my anxious mind. I'm Sam Mador, overthinker extraordinaire. This week, I'm overthinking about inclusion and mentorship with April Howe. April has been an active voice for diversity and inclusion for many years. And through her new company called Crayon Strategies, Inc., she is taking that to the next level. I really loved our chat and I hope you do too. I am here with April Howe. Hey, April. Hi, Samantha. Good to see you. It's good to see you too. It's so funny. You just called me Samantha and very few people call me Samantha anymore. I love it. I was trying to sound professional, Samantha. Work with me. Work with me. I love it. Well, <laughs> and you know, what's really funny. So just for context, for anyone listening, uh, we worked together about a million years ago. Yeah. And I would have been Samantha at the time when I worked at Robertson Surrett because I, at the time, would have been like early 20s trying to feel professional. Well, I probably thought I had to go by my full name. You know, the last time you've engaged with somebody is the age and time that they are frozen in in your mind. So That's in right. my mind, you're still that person back then. That's right. <laughs> Oh man, have I come a long way, April? You truly have. You truly have. I love and I, it. And I'm sure you have too. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm doing my best, Samantha. Yeah, I love it. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to stay with Samantha because that's how I feel. Stick with it. I'm All actually right. loving it. I love All it. Right. And it actually, honestly, it reminds me of my mom. So it makes me feel happy. There you go. <laughs> that's good. I love that I, I bring that out. Good. Yeah, it's good. So April, you and I've been, we've, we've had a couple of issues trying to have this conversation and I'm glad sure. we're finally connecting, but I am so excited. And I was doing a deep dive onto your website the other day. I'm so excited to chat with you about all the work that you're doing with your new organization, your new business. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can give us just sort of a, a snippet of what it is that you're doing with your new business. Okay, snippet. So Crayon Strategies. Yeah. Um, and first of all, I'm interrupting you already, but I love the name. Thank you. I love I, it. The whole story, but I'll, I'll get to that maybe a, at another point. But uh, so Crayon Strategies. So Crayon Strategies is a diversity and inclusion um, we do some sort of HR strategy and coaching organization. I'd say the main part of my business is really around the diversity and inclusion piece. So diversity, inclusion, belonging, and equity. And yeah. I work with a lot of organizations around sort of unpacking, unraveling, and simplifying this whole diversity, inclusive workplaces, um, and, and figuring out what that means to you as an organization and what to implement and how do we frame it and how do we inoculate our organization. And it really starts by making the diversity inclusion conversation accessible. Mm. And what I mean by accessible is creating a conversation that anybody can contribute to because a lot of people are really uncomfortable they don't yep. know words they don't want to say the wrong thing and part of what I think is really important about our approach is creating accessible space for that conversation oh that is so interesting because yeah and I'm thinking you're talking when you say about accessibility and people not being comfortable it's like sitting in a group or like a meeting or something like that and asking for folks input and then not feeling like I want to speak up or not not trusting my voice in that moment is that sort of the context nope Let oh very clear <laughs> Awesome. Wrong door, Samantha, wrong door. <laughs> um, what I mean by that is, and I'll be very blunt, um, and I can't speak for all people in any demographic group, but a lot of people that I talk to that are white, for instance, mm -hmm. are super cautious about, you know, how do you refer to people? Can I bring this up? Can we have that conversation? And so the accessibility is inviting people into a conversation that maybe you thought you had no business being a part of or didn't know how to be a part. Right? Yeah. So, okay. So inviting people into that conversation and saying not knowing is absolutely okay. Not understanding is okay. What's more important is curiosity. What's more mm. important is having a learning mindset. Right. And after that, let's have the conversation. 
So yeah. I, I just think that so many people fear the conversation um, about anything. Um, you know, I talk often about being, you know, a black leader in primarily, I would say 95% of the rooms that I'm in are white rooms. Right. right? So now it sounds maybe less benign when I say it, but if Samantha said that, yeah. Hey, would you be comfortable saying it? Right. First of all, right. And maybe, maybe not. So, but you should be, it's okay. Yeah. And so once we have those conversations and say, I don't, you don't have to know everything. You just want to understand that's all you need to really yeah. get into the conversation. And it starts there. It starts. Yeah. There. yeah. I love that so much. And, and it's that fear of judgment, right. Or fear of, like you said, saying the wrong thing or looking silly or offending somebody, whatever that is, it's that fear that keeps us from saying anything at all. And, you know, that's, that's exactly it. A lot of people would say, oh, well, it's the cancer council culture that we have. Yeah. I say, well, this existed before cancel culture came along, right? Mm -hmm. That's a newer phenomenon, but people didn't really want to touch so much on these topics before cancel culture came. So I think this runs deeper than that. I think yeah. it's, it's really people not necessarily feeling um, confident around talking about subjects that they don't have exposure to, right? Yeah. Don't have lived experience around. They don't necessarily understand the experience and God love you. You know, you don't know maybe. Right. And so I'd rather just not go there and affect yeah. somebody, right? So I, I, and I understand that, mm -hmm. but what it does is it prevents us from moving forward. If we're not talking about it, mm -hmm. then we don't get to progress. And so that's why it's so important to create the accessibility to the conversation. Totally. And then it just becomes the elephant in the room too, right? Where it's like, it's that kind of uncomfortable situation that nobody's bringing up, but, but why? Right. But here's the thing. I'm the elephant in the room. Right? right. Usually when we talk about the elephant, it's this idea, it's right. this perspective, but I'm the elephant in that scenario. Right. So it's very different. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. I wasn't thinking of it in that way, but that puts it into perspective. Cause yeah, usually it's like this topic that we don't want right. to talk about, not a physical right. human. Right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so right. It, it, it takes on a very different dynamic when there's a person in the room that represents the ele the elephant. Yeah. Right? So the elephant knows they're the elephant. Yeah. Everybody else knows they're the elephant. And so the not talking about it part is the invisibility, but yet taking up so much space. Right. Yeah. And so how do you start those conversations? Like, how do you, uh, and I'm not going to get your sales pitch. I'm not asking you for your sales pitch, but you can totally give it to me if you want. No but way. like, how do you start those conversations with organizations or businesses or, 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 or just people groups? Well, uh, I'll be honest with you, depending on the scenario, um, I've been very fortunate that there's lots of people that want to understand and want accessibility to the conversation. So yeah. I don't have to pitch. I don't have a sales pitch because there's demand, right? It, it exists. Good. Yeah. So I've been very, very fortunate that uh, organizations are reaching out. Now, once I'm sitting down with someone, yeah, it looks like this, right? Okay. Yep. Oh, you know, what is it that you want for your organization? What's the culture you're trying to create? How do you want people to feel, not just when they're there? What do you want them to say about you when they leave? Yeah. What do you want people to say behind your back as a leader, as an organization? Yeah. And you can control that narrative by creating the environment and being and living the environment that you want, but it's not easy. It's mm. hard and it takes awareness and you got to call it out. And, you know, I, I think I'm kind of known for being fairly direct, but honest. And right. so really being true about, you got to understand what you're working with 
And all the best intentions in the world are not going to create the environment that you want. It, it just can't be intention. It has to yeah. be strategy. It has to be honesty. It has to be engaging expertise. It's all these elements, right? Um, starting with good intention. And even that good intention doesn't mean you're not causing harm. Right. Yes. Well, that's the, that's, that's the main thing, right? You hurt somebody's feelings. And you're just like, well, well, I didn't, I didn't mean to. It's like, well, that actually doesn't matter. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. You know, I was about to hit the ball with the bat and I, I, I hit your arm and broke your arm. Well, right. I really didn't mean to do that. So I'm good. I'm, I'm well, it's okay. Yeah. Hands <laughs> off. Yeah. No, it's not okay. It's not yeah. okay. <laughs> I love it. And I do want to actually dive into the meaning behind the name of your business too, because oh. I, that was the part that really struck me on your website. I read through, but I wanted to give, I want to give you the opportunity to share that as well. Cause I love it. Oh, thank you. It, it is one of my favorite stories. So um, I remember, and, and every time I tell the story, it takes me back, but I do mm. remember being on my bedroom floor with my powder blue satin spreadsheet and my powder blue shag rug. And so this was like a couple of weeks ago. Clearly, <laughs> clearly, clearly times, you know, 25, 30 years. So <laughs> it's honestly about seven or six. And I just remember laying on the floor with my feet up and I had my box of crayons and I'm, you know, doing the house with the family the way my family looks yep. and, you know, go to color in my family. Um, and it's not like my family's not dark Brown, like their skin. It's not mm -hmm. like this deep, deep, deep chocolate Brown is not black. Um, so there's no crayon, there's no crayon for my family, but there yeah. was one crayon called skin. And I pulled that out and I'm like, that doesn't look like anything like my family. And why is there only one? Right. So look, at six, I was not having a cultural awakening. I well, just didn't understand very practically why there was only one crayon called skin. Yeah. Flesh. And I, you know, so I didn't understand that then. And as I grew, it was always a question and yeah. it just always lingered with me. And so as I became, as I got older, um, it did turn into something that had meaning and it was a more societal question, um, right. but it was symbolic of a lot of things, but it was symbolic of, you know, the elements of, of discrimination, the elements of marginalization. Um, if someone who's creating a product for all children only having one representative crayon. And it wasn't until many decades later that the company Crayola, yeah, is different than crayons, but Crayola came out with this box of diversity and everybody was praising it and saying how wonderful it is. And I thought, okay, it's 2000 and whatever year it was, 18, yeah. 19, whatever year it was. And I thought, that's a, that's a big gap. Yeah. Long time to figure it. Yeah. Right? So, so for me, my organization um, was built on the feeling that that six-year-old child had when they were laying on the powder blue shag rug on the floor. And, and that is the base for my business. And so crayon strategies, um, that is that that's it embodies that. I just love that so much. And even and I don't want to put words in your mouth at all. So I want to ask you this question. Does it also sort of make you feel forgotten? Is that a word that you would like or just not consider? No, unseen. Unseen. Because we are definitely considered. Right. We've yeah. always been considered. Right. Unseen unvalued if that's the term yeah um, not considered a, of the same value as anybody else right yeah there was a study many many years ago I remember I was in high school when this came out 
And the question to a group of, I don't know, 1,200 people was, would you rather be poor and white or black and rich? And this was a multicultural group. Right. And poor and white overwhelmingly trumped. <sighs> overwhelmingly. And I don't remember the numbers, but you get the point. Yes. The part that bothered me a lot were the black people that yes. all voted poor and white. Yeah. So it it you know, there's this uh belief system and this value system that we have in society um, that has not been able to equalize itself. Mm -hmm. And so we have to do that for ourselves. That's right. right. So I'm glad to be part of that, that, that movement, if I can use that term. For sure. Yeah. And I think like the word, you know, obviously you mentioned diversity, respect, all of, all of those words. Um, and belonging was another word that you highlight on your website and that you already mentioned here today too. And that's such a word that, you know, to feel that you don't belong, there's like fitting in and then there's belonging and to feel like you don't belong just has so much weight to it in terms of like being able to be yourself and show up as your real self and still feeling like you deserve to be there. 100%. And it's such a, basic need yeah. right like being belonging is and it's a low level thing right like being right long is not asking for the world um but it's that it's it's the value that we place on societal groups and so as a species we like to you know we're highly social right we yeah. have social structures but some of our thinking has gotten in the way, and this is based on evolution, based on just how the world evolved. Um, some of our thinking has gotten, gotten in the way of what I would consider to be normal socialization. You mm -hmm. know, in a perfect world, we would all, there'd be this great mix of people and there wouldn't be values put on skin tone and then all these assumptions that come with that yeah. all of which are I mean not really based on anything right there's no yeah. there's no science there's we, we know that um, race is a construct and not a biology um, so these are thought up things that we've come up with and that's what's tough because those thought up things that have endured for generations have impacted generations of peoples and families right and not just yeah. black people obviously right uh, you could speak to a lot of different cultural groups and that that human thinking um that's not always helpful has gotten in the way yeah just sort of that and I'm using air quotes that default right is like it's just it should never be right the default yeah right yeah right. And, and just thinking of the default is thinking like, even going back to that study you referenced is like, I'd rather be white and poor. Like that is just completely shocking. And it just sounds ridiculous when you think about how important people weigh money in their lives too. And you know what I mean? So to be able to default to, oh, well, I'd rather be white than, than yeah. have to deal with. But that just tells you how much value accepted yes. you, right? accepted value yeah. we have put on the concept of being white that's concept. right i use that term very intentionally right yeah what we think being white entails and what it gets you um and you know everybody knows about and talks about you know the sort of you know privilege and all of those things yes. and so i guess i shouldn't say it's a concept because there are real privileges um but just thinking about it's better to be that than anything else, or at least in this instance, black, um, yeah. but have the resources such as money, because money is not just about riches, right? It's about yeah. opportunity. It's about freedom. It's about, you know, being able to make your own choices and decisions. Yeah. And so to me, money is not just stuff I can buy. It's whatever yeah. it is. And people will still opt for, 
a race that is seemingly more valued than having that 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 real tangible um ability to create your own sort of wealth in a way. Yeah. Wow. That is just shocking. I'm a processor. So I'm going to take that one away with me still, I think after this conversation, because it just, you know, when you said it, it hit me, but I just, I can't believe that, you know, mm. for the majority of the folks filling out that survey or whatever it was. Wow. And I, you know, Samantha, not to dig too deep on it, but I also thought about it in the other sense, because as a black woman, I don't ever want to be white. Mm. Not that there's anything wrong with being white, mm -hmm. but I love my blackness. That's how you identify or who, like, yeah, that's part of how right. you identify yourself. Yeah. And it, but it goes beyond identity. See, mm -hmm. because what has happened is because in our society, I am generally speaking of, you know, can be seen of less value from a, a, an ethnic perspective perspective yeah. and so what happens is that actually generates its own value within that group right because I've had to fight I've had to endure my ancestors have done it and so now by making me feel like I'm a bit of an outsider it actually has ger generated this self-value that I now have that right much pride and such a uh, belief of self and resilience. Yeah. So it's interesting. And I'm not speaking for all people of color by any means. Of course not. Yeah. Um, but many black people, and we talk about black pride. I mean, that's a lot of times where it comes from. Right. Yeah. Man, I have to ask this. It's a little off topic, but are you a mentor to, to people in the black community in Halifax, April? I am. Yes. In what ways? Like, how do you, how do you, because you, you just, you've got it written all over your face if you don't. So I was going to encourage you to become one to, to someone. Um, how does that show up for you in, in the community? So I have, um, I've always been a mentor, but I mean that in the more formal sense. So yeah. um, mentoring to me is, is, you know, and there's many ways to show up as a mentor, but people have come to me and I've said, okay, formally, if we're entering into a mentoring relationship, I need to understand what are your goals? How often will we meet? What do you know? How do you want to communicate? Um, I'll bring you to things. And so we sort of map out what would the value of mentorship be to you and what can I bring to that? And so it, they are very formal mentoring relationships that I have. And so, yeah. and I don't, I usually do it for about a year. Um, and then I don't go seeking people to mentor, but if I'm, if I'm asked and there's a, what I call clickage, if I click with that person <laughs> um, and then, yeah, we'll, we'll move forward. So I've definitely um, mentored some, some young professionals and some emerging leaders and, uh, and I learned from it too. So uh, mentoring yeah. is just a one way street, right? It's, it's something that I get to learn from, um, you know, there's this thing about reverse mentoring, right? Where someone who is yeah. younger and they're more socially savvy and technical and um, obviously have a viewpoint of a different generation. And then mm -hmm. I can learn from them on those pieces. So totally. it, it, it really can be uh, mutually beneficial. Oh, that's awesome. You just made me think I do work. I work with the United Way and uh, we have a youth committee and I'm always just blown away by the benefit and the, in just the conversations and the idea generation and all of those things that you're just like, I'm learning, I think, as much from you as yeah. you are from me in this whole experience, maybe more. Absolutely. <laughs> and I, I do not allow young people to feel like they can't be the ones to do the teaching, right? Yeah. Yeah. You can't let that happen. It, they have so, there's so much um, that the, the next generation has to teach us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we think about, you know, gig work and we think about just approaches to social media and there's just so much that we can learn. We won't use it all. Great to know. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And you do speaking gigs too. Hey, I do. I do a fair bit actually. Um, yeah. 
And I love doing it. I can't, I got to tell you, it's, it's probably a little bit of my ego because there's nothing more amazing than people thinking you have something to say that's going to matter to them. Oh man. I, I can't think of a bigger compliment yes. and that people want to hear you say stuff. <laughs> yes. And they're maybe. taking notes maybe too. I they're know. like, right? <laughs> like look at, they're taking another note. Look at that. I, I, I absolutely love it. And um, I'm a bit of a nerd. So I'll do the deep research, you know, dive before I speak at an event. Um, but I really do quite enjoy the public speaking. I've uh, at times found myself a little bit out of, or feeling like I was out of my depth. And so, you know, you try to compensate with research and figuring out, but at the end of the day, um, getting up there and being as unvarnished as possible works every time. Yeah. Every time. And, and storytelling, right? Like a lot of it is, is storytelling. It really is. That's, um, and it, it, you know, I really believe in the power of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of my stories do not paint me in the best light. Right. But they were amazing learning opportunities and experiences that people are like, oh, I can't believe she's saying it out loud, but I know I've, I've been there. I've done that. I've had that happen to me. Yeah. And so, yeah, it, it, it is, you kind of, you know, I bear my soul a bit, but it feels so good when people tell me, it's like, I loved your story. It's like, oh, thank you. Thank you. There's no better way to make a connection. You know, you can go up and show as many graphs and diagrams and whatever that you want, but until you show that bit of vulnerability, you're a real person who's telling their story and learned experience. It's like, there's no better way to connect. A hundred percent. And, you know, failure is a hard thing to the beauty of failure. Um, Cause we've all failed. Yeah. And you're going to fail tomorrow and I'm going to fail yes. next week. Right. Yeah. Um, and so just being real about that and not that all my talks were completely about failure, but I just think that, that as a public speaker, for me, the vulnerable component um, is really important. And um, I really try to make sure I hold on to that. I love that. And I just recently had the opportunity to speak at my high school about they were doing a social justice day and they asked me to come and speak about me my mental health journey and struggling with mental illness and yeah. it was just this like crazy moment that I've had I've been in the school since I graduated I mean gosh that was a long time ago but not in this context so walking through the door I was thinking about how when I got there I you know when I was in high school, I was just starting to struggle with my mental health, with, with depression and anxiety. And I just didn't really know how to put those into words yet. And yeah. so now fast forward and I get to share that experience with other kids who are potentially experiencing the same thing. And it just made me feel so great to be able to share that with in that context, especially because I could feel and relate to them so much. And getting the feedback afterward was just the biggest gift for me. Well, what's amazing about that is, you know, you walk the halls of that high school and guaranteed there are people in that audience that have felt the exact same thing that you were feeling yeah. and are like, she walked my walk. She's walking my walk and yeah. connecting on that level and being that vulnerable, um, I think, and then seeing you thrive is... Mm -hmm is a gift for sharing. Yeah, it was just, it was a really cool feeling for yeah. sure. Do yeah. you do talks with, with, in schools or with younger folks as well? Ah, uh, so funny you say that. I, um, I do work with, within the education sector, but mostly mm -hmm. with admin administration and faculty. But okay. ironically, I just received a call about two days ago to speak with students. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in a couple schools in Nova Scotia. And so I was just starting to um, develop what that would look and feel like. Yeah. Um, and so, yes, this will be, I think, one of my first times, to be honest. Yeah, to talk in schools. I'd love to do more of it, though. Yeah, no, that's, yeah, well, let's put that out in the universe and then it'll come back at you. <laughs> there, done. <laughs> done. Yeah, snap our fingers. Yeah. Um, I... I want to talk to you about your mental health and what, what, if anything, 
this work has done for you and your own mental wellness? Mm. So um, I struggle, I'd say for about the last 15 years with um, anxiety. And I also was diagnosed two and a half years ago with ADHD. Mm. And um, there's nothing like knowing something's not right, but not knowing what's wrong. Yes. And those two things can live at the same time. Um, I just, that's such a great way to put it, April, especially anything with mental illness. That is such a great, a great way to frame it. Well, here's what I've learned that naming it is a game changer. Mm right? Because mm -hmm. what naming it does is puts parameters around it, mm -hmm. right? So when it could be anything, this could get worse. This could yep. be my demise. This could inflict my whole family. Like it could be anything. Yeah. And then when someone tells you, you don't have, you know, you're not bipolar, you're not, you don't have, you know, borderline personality disorder. You're actually a combination of anxiety with ADHD. Mm -hmm. Oh, so now I have parameters. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and so the relief of getting a diagnosis, I mean, not that you would stop there. Right. But it, th those words was the beginning of the healing process, just the mm -hmm. words, right? Yeah. And so for me, um, that was a really emotional moment um, in the uh, my psychiatrist office, psychologist, psychiatrist. And so from there, it became, all right, so now what do we do? Because I'm like, a, let's fix it, yeah. right? I am the let's fix it girl. Yeah. And that is not a short, quick, one pill process. Who knew? Yeah, right. <laughs> There's not yeah. one pill. Yeah. Very disappointing. When I'm <laughs> laughing from experience. <laughs> I know you are. I know you are. And so I, I'm not a patient person. I don't have time to have ADHD. I don't have time to have anxiety. I don't have time for that. Well, the okay. funny thing is that they both have time for me. And so I really had to slow my roll and sort of give in to the fact that I'm not broken. I just mm -hmm. need to manage who I now am and who I now have learned that I am. Yes. Right? I'm not yes. going to fix it. Right. I have yes. to live with it. So it's not just something that's happened to me or it's not like a sweater I put on. It's, it's me. That's who yeah. I am. I'm a person with anxiety and I'm a person with ADHD. And some things I'm going to say things, sometimes I'll say things because my mouth is three steps ahead of my brain. Um, I forget everything all the time. And it's not because I don't care. Yeah. I do care. I don't know how to remember. And right. learning and, and no longer making excuses Um became part of my acceptance mm. right so I no longer fret about I see somebody walking towards me I know I should know their name but mm -hmm. I know I don't know their name and we all get that oh my god what's her name what's her name what's her name what's her name I don't do that anymore right I tell people and this is my truth hi we work together Ah, uh, at KBRS, I'm not going to remember your name because the names only stay with me for about 20 minutes. And you'll say, Samantha. And I'll go, yeah. yes. Here's the three things I remember about you. Because I will remember the context of a person. I will remember how someone made me feel, which we most do. Yes. If you lean in on how someone made you feel, not remembering their name doesn't mean a Minor. Bit. Right. So yeah. that is the antidote for me. I like that. To my ADHD, right? Yeah. I'm late for everything. Mm -hmm. Not because I don't care. I do my best to manage my time. It doesn't, it simply does not work that way in my head. Right. It just doesn't. If something pulls me over here 
and I do a deep dive and then I pull my head up and it's like, oh my God, I'm yet again, 10 minutes late. I was 10 minutes late for this, this taping. <laughs> yes. But yeah. not because I don't care. Well, frankly, it's a little technical problem. But the point is, I could have started on those technical issues 10 minutes earlier, right? Right. So, and I think to your point, it's communicating that, like, even yes. when you say that to the person you run into and you're like, oh, you know, whatever, what, however you explain yeah. it, I think just having that addressing it again, elephant in the room, but addressing the fact that maybe you don't remember your, that person's name, but you do remember these things about them, I think is calling it out instead of just feeling embarrassed that you never, you didn't remember it in the right. first place. And that it's okay that how they made me feel is more important than their name. That's right. Because for me, that would mean more to me than you saying April. So right. I can't remember your name, but you you spoke at that event and I was really touched by what you said. It's way more to me than my name. That's right. Yeah. Oh, I like that. So it's just finding the narrative for you that is authentic um, and then lean in on it. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. April, Ooh. I always ask my guests and I'm put, I always put them on the spot. I never tell them in advance. I love this already. Yeah. Right. If you have sort of go-to quotes or mantras or a quote that you go to when it's like, I really, you know, I'm in it, or I just need a bit of a boost or motivation. Is there anything that you have? And the answer can be no, that you go to. Oh, there's two right off the top. Oh, great. Oh, I love it. So um, in my public speaking, not all of the public speaking or keynotes that I've done, but a lot of them, I referenced my mother, who I lost back in September. Sorry. And my mother was a very uneducated, brilliant woman. Mm. Grade six education was the smartest person I knew. Mm. So she said a couple things to me that I use to this day. So one is a bit crass, but I'll explain it. And the other. Oh, is, see, I love that already. You're already in. I'm in. <laughs> so I'm I'll, tell you the, I'll tell you the easy one first. So the Great. easy one she would say to me is you have to behave what you believe. Oh. So if you believe in equity and fairness and doing the right thing and being kind what are you doing when you're not behaving that way mm. so if I was you know said something to her that not that I would ever say anything unkind to my mother but if I was just behaving in a way that was not congruent with who I know I am she would say oh were you behaving what you believe there because it doesn't feel that way mm. would she actually call you out in that moment oh if you <laughs> met my mother Oh my oh. lord. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. The other one that's a little more crass is, and she said this quite often. She's um, if I said, um, you know what, mom, I'm trying to get ahead on my job and I don't know if I can do this. I'm trying to figure out like they just won't give me the opportunities that I need. And she said, well, well, you better go drink your spit. Drink your spit. Okay, I need the explanation. <laughs> Generate your own answers. Generate your own opportunities. If you're thirsty, drink your spit. Okay. You need to figure out how to do it for yourself. Do not lean on everybody. Everybody else is not going to make your success. How can you drink your spit? Oh, man. I, I love it. And I'm not going to lie. I kind of hate it at the same time. I hate it too, but my mother said it. So what do you want me to do? No, I, <laughs> I love it more than I hate it, but yeah, I love that. Yeah. And it's, it's that idea. I, like you said, it's that idea that you create your own success. If I'm just going to sit here and wait for the phone to ring for a client or a contract or whatever that is, oh, I'm going to use that. I know I am. <laughs> she had she had a lot of them. So these are old country time sayings. She yeah. had a billion of them. So I created a keynote based on the things that she said, these strange, odd, you know, colloquialisms, if we want to use that term, and how I would apply them in a business or leadership setting. Oh, how cool is that? Yeah, yeah. So I love that. Favorite keynotes to do. 
And I get to honor my mother. So win-win. Win, win. Oh, yeah. I love that. And sorry for your loss to April. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, I feel like this is a great place to end on just because I'm, I'm already thinking about drinking my spit. So <laughs> I, <laughs> now I'm going to create my own success. I love it. There you go. Uh, listen, I'm so glad we finally got to connect April. It's so nice to see you again. You too, Samantha. I love this. Thanks for overthinking with me. Always. Thanks again to April for overthinking about diversity, inclusion, mentorship, all the good things. I really hope you enjoyed our chat as much as I did.